Last year, Phoebus released one of their most interesting watches ever, and that was the Sea Nymph, which is a 36 millimeter sized diver that's focused towards women, which is something you don't see too often in the micro brand world. It was a pretty interesting design, almost like a woman's monster with these rather pointed indices, as well as a 12 hour bezel, whirlpool galosh effect on the dial, and some rather vivid colors. And after I was done reviewing the Sea Nymph, I remember thinking that I would love to see a larger version, although maybe one that's a little bit more toned down. And a year and a half later, that's pretty much what we have with the brand new Voyager, albeit with a few differences. The most obvious of which is that they replaced that roll pull effect on the dial for one that's a bit more cocktail time than Davy Jones. But before we get to all of that, just for the sake of transparency, I do need to mention that just as in previous Phoebus reviews, they initially contacted me and asked if they could give me this watch to review. And as far as I know, they aren't asking for it back. So just bear that in mind going forward. But for now, let's jump right in. So Phoebus decided to keep this as a more moderate sized diver, going with a 40 millimeter wide case without and just over 43 millimeters with the crown. And I think that is a rather smart decision, as a 42 millimeter version of this would just be a bit over the top. It's also got a lug to lug of 46 millimeters, so overall it's a more compact footprint compared to some other modern divers out there, which should make this more accessible to a lot of different wrist sizes. However, this is on the tall side, as I measured a total thickness of 14 and a half millimeters. And that is from the top of a double dome sapphire to the bottom of a very embossed case back. It's still very manageable, but that height is noticeable. And at 170 grams with its bracelet, it has a really solid feel to it. It's enough weight that you notice when you pick it up, but it's still pretty comfortable on the wrist. Now that bracelet balances out the weight nicely, but if you do wear this on something like a NATO, it can feel slightly top heavy thanks to that extra height. Now rounding out the specs, you have a 20 millimeter lug width, 300 meters of water resistance, and it's all powered by Seiko NH35A movement. The finishing of the case is pretty good, and the only sharp edge or angle on the entire thing is on the side of the bezel, where it's actually supposed to be. When you look straight down at the Voyager, there's not a lot of the case to see basically just these stubby lugs that are coming out of it. Now the top of those lugs are brushed, but everything else you normally see has a mirror polish to it. And since there isn't any kind of beveled edge that runs along the side, the resulting mirrored wall on the left makes that 14 and millimeter thickness even more apparent. Overall, the polished finish looks great. And I think it's very fitting with the dial and bezel but you will find yourself wiping away smudges frequently. Away from prying eyes, you have the back, which is entirely brushed, including the nice embossed case back, which is complete with the Phoebus logo. And the case back is pretty similar to the last few Phoebuses I've seen. And just like the logo itself, you're either gonna love it or think it's a bit odd. Either way, that logo is also on the signed screw down crown. Now the crown is a bit small in proportion, as it's seated in between two slight bumps that act as crown guards, but it's just tall enough that you're easily able to grab it and screw it and use it. And this all brings us to the bezel, which I'm sure some of you have been staring at this entire time. And before I go over the design, let's just talk about the action, which overall has a great tactile feel to it and a nice audible click as you turn it. It's also one of the easiest bezels I've run across to use. It doesn't stick out very much from the case, but there's always enough surface area and traction on the edge of that bezel that you can get a good grip and turn it. It's also 120 click, unidirectional, and just a smidge of back play. So overall it's set up more like a timing bezel than say a 12 hour dual time. But other than that, it's a pretty good bezel. The design however, is one thing that surprised me. And when I first took this out of the box, I just wound up staring at it as I kind of had to take it in before I could even move on to the dial. I'm not sure what I was actually expecting, but I don't think this was quite it. 
Now it's basically a stainless steel insert, and one that's been sandblasted around the hour indicators, creating a sunken level. And that level has an almost frosted look to it, which by contrast makes the indicators on the bezel just really pop, as they not only stick up, but have a mirror polished finish on them. And this bezel insert is one of the major departures from the previous CNIM. And I think if they had gone with a colored aluminum or ceramic insert, it would have been a much safer choice here. Now, individually, I think this bezel looks really cool, but I've honestly gone back and forth on whether it really fits into the design, because at times, I do find that it distracts from the dial. Yet, one thing I have realized with the Voyager is that swapping out the bracelet makes a drastic difference in the look and feel of the watch. And I think that's especially true when the strap you use complements the dial, as that change seems to take the bezel from being part of a larger, more sterile metallic frame to then being more of an extension of the dial, and one that really pops out at you as it's surrounded by a touch of color, which for me has made a big difference in how I look at this watch. Anyway, I'm sure a lot of people have different opinions on this bezel, and feel free to write them out down below. But rather than just focus on this, let's move on to the dial itself, which is nothing short of stunning. It's something you would expect more on a dress watch than a diver. And no matter the angle or the lighting conditions, the sunburst effect on the textured dial is gorgeous. And this, I think, is a vast improvement over the flat whirlpool effect that was on the C-Nymph. Now, whenever I see anything quite like this, I automatically think about Seiko's cocktail time. But as gorgeous as this galosh dial is, it still can't compete with the magic that Seiko has done with that cocktail time. That Seiko is just on a whole other level. Now, the hardest thing to describe about this dial is the color itself. The other four Voyagers are a bit more obvious, but this brown one is kind of like a cross between mocha and copper, and it can shift a bit depending on the light. The color is a bit different, yet it's still vibrant, but maybe not over the top like say the green one. The indices are one of my favorite aspects of this watch. They're applied, and they're these rather pointed diamonds, with a slightly larger one at the 12, and maybe more of a hexagon at the 3 and 9. The polished framing and angular shape of those indices look beautiful, and they look right at home on that supernova of sunburst, with those points pointing inward and then following the path laid forth by the pattern texture. And that just draws your eyes right where it needs to be. Just beyond the indices, you have a detailed chapter ring with minute indicators, which I do appreciate from a functional standpoint, as it makes reading and setting the watch a whole lot easier but I think it does look out of place on a dressy dial. Now, moving down to the six, we have a date window with a very nice metallic framing. And I think this is one instance where I think they made the right choice going with a white date wheel instead of one that matches the dial. With the white color and the polished framing, I think it looks as if it was just another indice. So it blends in better, and I think looks rather symmetric with the overall design. I also really love the overall pointed hour hand, and I think it matches perfectly with the indices, which is something I think they should have followed with the other hands, keeping the same pattern but larger for the minute hand, and maybe a diamond on the end of the second hand instead of a lollipop. I think it would have looked better, but it's also being a little nitpicky. Overall, the Voyager looks fantastic, and the polished framing and white colored loom on the dial make the design not only elegant, but very functional and very easy to use. Even the Phoebus logo on the dial is a bit more subtle. It's usually very front and center, boldly standing out, but here it's just painted on in silver, almost blending into the background. Which the same can be said for the text on the bottom, as it's rather small and doesn't stand out, which helps keep the focus on the design itself. The Voyager is a gorgeous, well-made piece, but I think it's one that finds itself in an odd position as most watch geeks tend to like their divers more tool-like than dress, so I don't think the appeal is going to be quite as universal as some of their other watches. Although Loom, on the other hand, always has universal appeal, and I do love that they loomed up the chapter ring. So for a comparison test, I also included the Phoebus Bronze Eagle Ray and the Sea Nymph just to see how they stack up. Now, the Voyager isn't a Loom powerhouse like some of their other watches, 
but it easily keeps up with both the turtle and the eagle ray, so overall it's pretty good. Although what's really surprising here is that that smaller sea nymph outlasted the other three. So whatever they did on that one, they did it right. Now as for the movement, you have a standard Seiko NH35A workhorse. Standard beat rate, 40 hour power reserve, hacking and hand winding. Overall, just a great movement. And unlike my recent Dress KX, this one seems to keep much better time, gaining about 5 seconds a day. So really hard to go wrong with this movement at this price. However, I can't help but feel that if they had gone with a Miyota 9015 or maybe even a Salita, they could have kept the same design but had a slimmer profile, although that would result in a higher price tag. Anyway, let's move on to the bracelet, and the bracelet is really good. It has a great solid feel to it, a nice milled clasp, solid links, and solid end links. It's really beautiful looking, with a brushed outer section and polished middle sections that run the length of the watch and run straight into that bezel. The bracelet also balances out the watch nicely on the wrist, so overall it's pretty comfortable to wear. Although there are two things I need to mention. The first is that the links here are secured with a pin and collar system, which I think most people would agree is the most secure type of bracelet. Yet, it's also universally agreed upon that it's also the biggest pain in the ass to work on yourself. So just be aware of that and try not to lose the collar when it falls out and goes rolling across your desk. And secondly, if you do plan on swapping out this bracelet, be aware that there isn't a lot of clearance between the spring bar and the case. And I think that's partly due to the comfortable yet really stubby lugs. So really thin straps like this Perlon will work fine but anything else, and you're gonna need a set of curved spring bars. I even had to use them with this chain bracelet. And lastly, a brief word about value. Now, Phoebus is known for giving you a lot of bang for your buck, and this is no different. I believe it's listed at $269 on their website. But the thing with Phoebus is that there are always discount codes floating around for 10%, including the one for my channel, and that brings it closer to $242, which is even better. Now at that price, you're looking at double dome sapphire, a good bracelet, good loom, and basically a fully specced out Seiko NH35A watch. There's not a whole lot out there that looks quite like this, but if you are looking for a comparable spec watch, well, I think the best example out there right now is the new 40 millimeter Zello Swordfish, and those sold out like hotcakes at a similar 269. So the price and quality are definitely there, and it really comes down to how do you feel about this style of watch, as it's not your typical tool watch diver. It's got a bit more flash than that, and I kept thinking that it would be perfect to wear if I ever go back to somewhere like Atlantis. Now I'd still prefer it if this was a bit thinner, and I think the look of the sandblasted bezel is going to throw a lot of people. And regardless of how good the bracelet is, I still prefer how this bezel looks when it's next to a nice brown leather strap, where it still has some flash, but a bit more of a casual feel. Now, as a whole, I like the Voyager. It's got a great size, very comfortable, and I really love this dial. It's one of the more interesting divers I've run across this year, and I think it shows that Phoebus has come a long way from where they started with just a subby homage. And that's pretty much my take on it. But let me know down below what you think about the Phoebus Voyager, or if there are any other upcoming releases you'd like to see. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Till next time.